Hey everyone, this is Molly Graves Pryor with another video for you today. Um, this is the CRCA club race, uh, the first one uh, in Central Park from Sunday, March 6, uh, 2022. Um, club races uh, are held by, as I mentioned, CRCA, which stands for the Century Road Club Association, and they can be found at crca.net. Um, and these races are sponsored by uh, the Lucarelli and Castaldi law firm. Um, they also call themselves the bicycle crash lawyers. Um, and for those of you in the cycling community in New York and New Jersey, um, you know Lucarelli and Castaldi very well. Uh, they sponsor races all over the New York, New Jersey area. Um, they're just, they're very well known in the community. So, uh, you know, we're always uh, very thankful to have uh, have their sponsorship for our local races. Um, so this particular field uh, is the B field, um, which is for Cat 4s. The other fields that race in CRCA club races are the A field, which is basically the men's 1, 2, 3, which went off uh, before us. Uh, the C field, which is the Cat 5s. Um, there's also the W field, which is for women uh, 1 through 5 category, and the W dev, which is women's 4 or 5, I believe. Um, so as the B field, uh, this is actually a six-lap race, uh, which is about, for those of you uh, that don't know, the Central Park Loop is about 6.1 miles. Um, so it's a, a little over 36 miles, close to 37 miles. Um, and what we're doing here actually is uh, we're, we're doing a neutral lap. And the reason for that, uh, you know, you can see the Guggenheim on the right. Um, the reason for that is because uh, there is a lot of construction um, on the uh, upper portion of the course map that you can see that we're heading toward. And uh, they basically took half of the roadway on this very um, winding S-curve downhill uh, very fast. Um, and so they just wanted to make sure that, you know, we made it through the first time okay, um, you know, for, for people that may not have necessarily uh, been in Central Park any time uh, recently. I happen to, you know, currently live about a, a mile or so from Central Park, so, you know, I was well aware of it. Uh, but even I was surprised by, you know, how tiny <laughs> the roadway is um, when you are... Uh, when you're in a field with you know 40 to 50 other cyclists as opposed to riding by yourself so uh this one this is my second uh video and uh you know the first video i posted was you know about 10 minutes long um and i wanted to do this one in more of a long form kind of ad hoc uh approach and you know the reason for that uh is because i love racing in central park um you know I'm not actually really like a um, a particularly good you know criterium racer uh, like flat uh, flat fast courses uh, you know as far as like my power profile is concerned I'm more suited for long haul races with rolling terrain selective climbs things along those lines uh, which of course means that a, a course like Central Park you know it's basically my favorite course of all of the racing venues in New York City. Um, and for those of you who aren't, you know, affiliated with racing in New York City or uh, familiar with racing in New York City, uh, we have a lot of courses uh, from obviously Central Park. Uh, there's Prospect Park, um, Corona Park in Queens. Uh, Prospect Park is in Brooklyn, for those of you that don't know. There's Floyd Bennett Field, uh, which is also in Brooklyn. Um, you know, you, you just have uh many many courses like randall's island um which is as its namesake uh it's a really it's a really nice uh technical course um uh on randall's island and uh you know if you go just over the river in new jersey you have branch brook uh which is a really nice course as well so there's a lot of places um in new york city for us to race but you know for me by far central park is my favorite um just because of how beautiful the park is the, the sloping climbs and the um and the rolling terrain and just the sights uh, that you get to see um so you know that's the first thing that's one of the 
biggest reasons that I wanted to kind of do this more long form. And uh, I'm just going to take a pause. You can see here, you know, everyone kind of putting their hands out and saying, slow down, slow down. This is because we're coming up on the, um, the construction zone on this downhill. And you can see um, this is typically about twice as wide, this roadway. And you can see right there, there is hard construction there. Uh, the roadways has been completely pinched off. Um, and so, you know, this is the reason why they wanted us to be safe. Uh, typically in that area, there was actually a swimming pool, um, uh, but they've completely ripped that out and now are, are rebuilding it. I'm not exactly sure what they're putting in there, um, but this is the reason why we were neutral uh, for this first half lap. So, uh, you know, that being said, um, again, the reason why I wanted to kind of do this, you know, in terms of long form commentary um uh, is you know this was a very dynamic race um you know there were multiple break attempts uh, several of which i initiated several of which uh you know i would end up joining um multiple attacks um and you know just a lot of opportunities to kind of you know read the race and, and learn you know race dynamics and I use this as an opportunity to kind of put into practice a lot of the things that I've learned um, and a lot of the things that my coach, uh, Richard Sorensen of Velo John, um, you know, has been teaching me and uh, his partner, uh, Jerome Jacobs. Um, you know, I've been working with them uh, since the Green Mountain Stage Race um, up in Vermont. And uh, quick plug for that one, because that is a beautiful, beautiful stage race. Um, so I've been working with them since September and, uh, I just saw this as an opportunity to kind of really start putting into practice a lot of the lessons learned. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit more of a preamble and then we'll just, you know, get to kind of watching, uh, some of the footage and I'll chime in from time to time. Uh, this is actually Harlem Hill, uh, that we're going over and you can see, um, uh, you know, I'm spiking over 500 Watts, uh, right here and just. You know, one of the things about Harlem Hill was just maintaining contact um, as much as possible. Um, you know, a lot of times people will try and attack on this hill, uh, but, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about this when talking about some of the breaks that go on later, um, this concept of, of achieving escape velocity. And a lot of times people will try and uh, try and break away without having necessarily achieved, you know, what I like to call escape velocity. Um, so they'll get up the road, but it's like, you know, they're, they're a couple of bike lengths up the road. Um, so that's a very easy thing to cover and people can kind of just hop on and, uh, and, uh, ride in your wake. So, um, so yeah, basically, uh, you know, I think that there was a lot of opportunity, uh, to really learn and kind of, uh, uh, you know, put things into practice that they've been kind of it's trying to instill in me. And, you know, I'm trying to get better as a racer. Uh, last year was really the, uh, I'd say the first year um, that I actually really started racing. Uh, you know, I had done races in years past, but it was like, you know, five races in a year, or seven races in a year, you know, 10, two races in a year, that sort of thing. That's not really racing. Uh, last year I did 18 races uh, between June and, um, uh, October. Um, and so far this year, I've got uh, about 47 races on my calendar. It'll probably end up being somewhere around 55 to 60 by the time it's all said and done. Um, and it's also, you know, the first year that I'm coming into the season working with, you know, working with a coach. So last thing I'll say, um, you know, as we're coming uh, back on the backside of the course, um, the wind uh, was from a southwesterly uh, direction. So we're actually riding into a headwind right now. Uh, when we're on the opposite side of the course, it basically that's a tailwind. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, and one other thing is that uh, coming into this race, uh, it, you know, if you had seen my first video, you knew that I raced at Branch Brook the day before on, uh, on Saturday the 5th. And I'd actually done two races at Branch Brook. So this was my third race of the weekend. So um, strategically, you know, coming in, I knew I was going to be just absolutely exhausted. Um, you know, with a lot of fatigue from the last, uh, the two races the day before. You know, obviously I did as, you know, as well as I could to recover. Um, 
but there's only so much that you can do. So I really came in to uh, to this race really thinking about um, you know conservation, metering my efforts as wisely as possible, and you know as you'll see as the race uh, unfolds, sometimes I succeeded at that, and other times I <laughs> other times I failed quite miserably. Um, but really, just you know the concept of having an energy budget uh, was something that was very important to me. So. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we're just going to start, you know, watching the footage. Uh, you'll see we're, we're moving pretty well. And um, I'll chime in as things, uh, as things unfold. So you can see here, um, you know, one of the things when you're in a field that you really want to focus on, you just saw that, that near miss right there. Um, one of the things in the field that you really want to focus on is always, you know, you, you have to have your head on a swivel just to make sure that, um, you know, you know what's going on around you. But the most important thing really is always keeping your, your eyes, you know, forward facing and avoiding overlapping wheels as much as possible because you know if you have uh if you have your front wheel unprotected um and the person in front of you just happens to make an errant move and you're not paying attention you are you know very potentially going to get wiped out and you may take out all of the people that are behind you so um you know with just one of the things that just good you know, pack dynamics. That's not even just from a racing perspective. It's just, you know, riding in a pack of cyclists. Um, you know, always protect your front wheel, um, not only for your own sake, but also for the sakes of those around you. Um, you know, because we all have to ride together. We all have to ride, you know, safely and ride as, as smart as we possibly can. Um, but you notice also, unlike uh, the last video that I had uh, with respect to Branch Book, where I was, uh, you know, in the wind quite a bit, I've been actually spending quite a bit of time on the protected side of uh, the course, knowing that the wind was was coming from uh, basically the southwest, which was up until we made the turn um, on the right side um, of the field, I was riding, you know, as sheltered as possible on the left. And the reason for that is because, again, I know that I have a very limited amount of energy that I can expend on this day. Um, and so trying to avoid riding in the wind as much as possible and making sure that I stay sheltered as much as possible, you can see that coming around, my heart rate was like in the 130s, um, but we were still doing, you know, 27 to 29 miles an hour. So um, that's just one of those things where I've learned that over time. Um, again, you know, you learn by racing, you learn by um, watching other people race, uh, you know, there's other YouTube channels out there that do race analysis that, that yeah, I watch and I learn, like uh, one of them being NorCal Cyclist. Uh, you know, he's a he's a, a good channel that I watch, Vegan Cyclist, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, so I learn as much as I possibly can, and then I try to apply those things in race, um, in race situations. Um, and so I'm doing the same thing here, you know, just trying to take what I've learned and pass on what little as I know as a, as a Cat 4 cyclist, looking to, looking to become a Cat 3 hopefully in the next week or so, um, 
you know, pass that along. So uh, we actually just came out of uh, Horseshoe Alley. Um, <laughs> and it is colloquially known as Horseshit Alley, actually, because there are a lot of horses that line uh, 59th Street, uh, the, the southern edge of the Central Park. And so, you know, there's a lot of horse manure uh, in there. Whoops, uh, 346 uh, <laughs> saw almost uh, wiped out right there. And again, like I said before, in Cat 4 fields, you are very prone to see um, sometimes less than stellar uh, bike handling skills. But, you know, um, that's also just part of racing. You always have to, uh, again, be looking forward and be ready to, you know, not only ride uh, defensively, um, but also ride proactively. So, again, protecting your wheel uh, is, a, is a great way to ride defensively and ride proactively. Um, and trying to anticipate where people may go and so on and so forth so you can put yourself in a position um, just like i did right there uh seeing an opening and just moving to close that opening um so that uh you know i don't have to worry about other people coming around or potentially you know taking me out from behind if they hook my handlebars things along those lines so this climb is cat's paw by the way and we're just about back at the start line um so climbing in you can see this is a five percent grade um cat's paw is actually quite deceptive um because you get over the main five percent uh climb but then you're basically what feels you know you're on a false flat until you right now we just crossed uh, the start finish line and then you start uh, the lap all over again so um that's actually a, a very deceptive climb um that can trip up a lot of people. It's also a lot longer uh, than it looks, and so you know, just keep it, keep that in mind. Because uh, again, throughout the course of this race, I kind of just came in with the game plan of um, conserve as much as possible, and if I see an opportunity to you know to do something to try and take it, but otherwise, uh, uh, just try and stay in the mix, but don't use too many bullets and, and too much energy unwisely. So we're, uh, we're now coming up on this really long straightaway. It's uh, parallel to Fifth Avenue. Um, as I mentioned before, that's the Guggenheim on the right-hand side. Um, and in other CRCA races, uh, the finish line would actually be um, here. There's a, a landmark known as Engineer's Gate, um, which is at 96th Street. We're about to pass it right now. Uh, that's Engineer's Gate right there uh, that we're passing. Um, and for those of you who may not necessarily be too f as familiar with Central Park uh, landmarks as possible, but this this is uh, basically where one of the finish lines is. Um, you know, the, the finish line will change. Sometimes it's tapping on the green. Um, sometimes it's on the, uh, um, I think it's, there's another one on like 90, 99th Street or something like that on the west side. Um, I forget exactly, but uh, the, the finish line is not always uh, cat's paw. So here uh, you can see the field is speeding up, um, and that's because once you get out of the, the flat section around Engineer's Gate, um, you know, the road gets uh, very windy. It's a downhill. You see 2% or so. Um, and everyone is also um, trying to be very strategic about speeding up here because now that everyone is familiar with the fact that the, the primary downhill leading to Harlem Hill uh is so pinched they're trying to get to that as quickly as possible so you know if you have a field of 50 cyclists that are trying to squeeze through that one lane um obviously you know if you're in that top 15 or so then you can choose the best lines going into the downhill and that's actually part of the reason why i'm out of the wind expending energy here also to get 
uh, closer to the front uh, because I don't want to have to be in a situation where I'm touching brakes, you know, where I'm in two close quarters um, having to navigate that single lane. And, you, you know, you see other people here uh, doing the same exact thing. It's just a race to the downhill. So that was another factor that uh, that played in. It was one of the things that I learned strategically as I was watching the race unfold. Again, one of the things that uh, you know, uh, Coach uh, Sorensen has been uh, you know teaching me is about reading the race in real time and understanding the dynamics of what's going on and why people are reacting the way that they're reacting. So that move that I made earlier uh, was an on-the-fly uh, decision based on what I had seen other people doing, and then thinking, putting myself in their shoes. Uh, why would I do that? So I actually hear, you just saw I spiked up to about 600 watts or so. Um, and part of the reason, because I thought that these guys might actually try to attack on Harlem Hill. And I saw that uh, cyclist up front. But what actually ended up happening, and the reason why I'm, I changed the camera to the rear here is, I saw the field starting to slow down. People were starting to touch brakes. And I'm, my momentum is carrying through. And I don't generally like to touch brakes going into a climb at all. So I'm looking and everyone's trying to slow down. So I actually just on the fly saw it as an opportunity to attack. I spiked it up to over 850 watts. Um, and now, uh, you know, I'm holding well over 700 watts uh, for probably like a good 20 seconds, uh, 20 to 30 seconds or so. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about escape velocity. Um, whenever doing an attack, one of the things that um, I've been working on with my coaches and um, you know, learning is that if you want to attack successfully from the field, you have to get away with a hard punch um, so that no one can get into your draft um, and that basically you are going to make people hesitate and say, do I really want to follow this attack? So you can see basically uh, coming up over Holland Hill, um, I think my average power uh, climbing on Harlan Hill with this attack was about 600 watts or so for about a minute or so. And my goal was to get to the top of the hill. And then you can see going over, um, even though I'm on the downhill right now, I'm still applying power. And the reason why I'm doing this um, is because a lot of times when people get to the top of the hill, mentally they want to relax. But if you can figure out a way to, you know, basically uh, continue to apply power, um, and you can see the field was almost out of sight. Uh, and that was my goal too, another psychological aspect of, of brake riding. And this is, again, one of the things that um, I'm more suited for. If you can get out of sight, then psychologically that will tend to demoralize uh, the field and make it, sometimes it'll make it a, uh, them think twice about whether or not they want to close this down. So at this point, I actually had about a 10, maybe 11 second gap on the field. And you can see in the distance, there's two riders that are trying to bridge across at the moment. And uh, my, I, my goal here was punch it hard over Harlem Hill. And as I said, I, you know, I held about 600 watts or so for about a minute and then settle into you know threshold efforts. Now the reason why I was spiking 450 to 550 is because this is the this uh, was the first of the sisters, what's known as the three sisters, and it's basically a climb. You then go into this downhill area, and then you climb again, another downhill, and then you climb again, and then you're in the you know the fast uh, uh, part of the course downhill and into flat before you come back around into Horseshoe Alley. So I'm sitting here thinking. Let me do threshold efforts. Um, and if I can maintain threshold, you know, knowing that I only have a limited amount of budget, my goal here was to tease out um, some riders uh, that would see me riding away. And if, you know, the strongest of the strong um, are able and willing to bridge up, then that could be the establishment of a, of a breakaway. So the thing is, uh, you had this rider here and uh, one other person behind him, or two, uh, I think two other people behind him. Um, but there were a couple of uh, mistakes that were made. Um, if you're coming up on someone who has broken away, you need to announce to the person who was ahead of you, who was the primary target so that you can create a break, you need to announce to them uh, that you're coming. And so, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, he just came up, he did the right thing, he came through, 
he took a poll, um, you know, to give me a rest and to know he was there. And then, uh, you know, he came off. So a couple of things. Um, the first thing of establishing a successful break is making sure that everyone settles in to a stable and steady rotation. And one of the things that I was actually mentioning to, you know, my would be break mates is keep the pace steady. Don't punch it up. Don't punch up the speed. We have to make sure that everyone stays steady and that we rotate. And when I saw that uh, that was not happening, I knew immediately that this break was going to be doomed. And so, um, you know, when you when you get into a successful break and I've been in several you know successful breaks before, um, you can kind of just settle into a rhythm immediately. Everyone pulling through easily. You can see right here, um, you know, they're going extremely hard, but they're pulling through too quickly. And so I looked at this and I said, okay, uh, there's pretty much no hope for this particular break. I looked back a couple of times, saw the field there um, and said, okay, I'm just going to sit in. I had a mind actually here to uh, counterattack because if the field, you can see a single file, and that's the reason why I have the rear camera and the, the primary view. If the field is single file, that means that they are, you know, they're going all out. And so my thought here was the field is going to catch on. They're going to try and catch a physical and a mental break. Um, and sometimes, you know, depending on how you're feeling, sometimes it can be exceedingly psychologically demor demoralizing to punch it and go again. Um, but in this particular case, you know, remember I said before I was coming into the race, I already had, you know, two races on my on my ledger, so I was tired. But I was also thinking, someone else, this is a great opportunity to counterattack. And coming through here, I was just like, okay, no one's counterattacking. I'm actually shocked by this, what's happening. And as I'm thinking that I'm surprised that no one is counterattacking, here comes the counterattack. But if I had been them, I would have actually counterattacked probably about 30 seconds or so earlier. Um, because that's like, up until this point, the field had an opportunity, even if it was like, you know, 30 seconds or so to kind of regroup it, you know, on itself. Uh, you know, the other, um, the other mistake that those two made is that they didn't actually achieve the uh, escape velocity that I had mentioned. Um, they attacked on an area of the course that is naturally fast. Um, and, you know, there's, there is like, we are riding into the headwind, as you recall, uh, me mentioning earlier, but that headwind area is only going to last maybe another 10 seconds or so. So they're not even going to be able to get the advantage. And the field having been able to kind of like collect itself has already, you know, seen the, uh, the fruits of its labors uh, work in terms of tracking down a would-be break. So they're looking at these two and saying, okay, well, you know, we're going to be able to get them too. So, um, but that being said, you know, going back to the, um, uh, about getting escape velocity and counterattacking, uh, the reason why I say this is because, uh, uh, when I was at the Green Mountain Stage race last September, um, this was actually day three and, uh, it was a 64 mile road race, uh, with several, uh, extremely selective climbs. We were climbing, uh, I think, uh, the Appalachian Gap, App Gap, uh, and I think Lincoln Gap was another one that we were climbing. And um, I saw a you know group of five go up the road. Um, I waited for one more, and then I punched hard, same way I had done up Harlem Hill, achieving escape velocity. And when I approached the break, and at that point it was a break of six, I didn't uh, do what you know uh, the gentleman did when he rolled up. Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't announce himself. He rolled up. He took, uh, you know, like a ten-second pull, and then he rolled off. I ro I actually announced to them when I was a few bike lengths away from joining the break. I said, "I'm here. Uh, there's a huge gap. Let's go." And I rolled. I sailed right past the 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 break, and I got on the front, and then I stayed on the front with a hard but steady pull for about a minute. And the reason why I did that, even though I had just done a hard effort, was because I wanted to establish a level of consistency. And I also wanted to give 
um, the person who had been uh, riding on the front in the brake and pulling the brake at, uh, up until that point, I wanted to give them a rest. And so after about a minute, I pulled off and then said, let's rotate, keep the pull short, let's let's go through and then we can stay away and let's grow this lead. And you know, we actually, we grew the lead up to the point where um, uh, when we reached the, the, the first climb um, and my coach uh, who I had met was actually in that break, uh, Rick Sorensen, he was in that break. Um, when we reached the break, uh, the, the first climb, uh, we had like a like a two or three minute lead um, on the field, and we were rotating well. We were communicating well. Uh, we were not surging or anything along those lines. Um, and that was actually that was actually a very successful break. So that's how you can establish a break, um, especially you know it's like there was no reason why that initial attempt should have failed. Like if if, if we had been able to uh, basically settle in. Um, we would have we would have been perfectly fine uh, as far as staying away from the field because if you have five riders um, on a course like this, uh, you can stay away from uh, from a field in Central Park uh, pretty effectively um, and make sure that you know everyone is resting well. Um, so you know that was just like one anecdote of, of brake racing. Um, you know, it, it's kind of my favorite form <laughs> of racing. I, and again, it's likely just due to my power profile. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm not a punchy sprinter at all, um, but I can hold threshold for, um, you know, for a long time very comfortably. So, you know, that lends itself to brake riding just generally. So that being said, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to the race here. Uh, we just caught those two. Uh, as you saw, as I mentioned before, you can kind of tell whenever an attack is going, whether or not it's going to go anywhere. Um, and I pretty much knew that, uh, you know, that attack wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, so now we're all back together, everyone settling in. And, um, uh, you know, now I'm just making my way up. You see, I've already made up, you know, a number of wheels and I'm not expending that much energy um, uh, and I'm benefiting also in part by the fact that we have a tailwind so again all of these different things are playing into the factor of you know I just used up a, a huge bullet on that uh, that failed attempt uh, earlier and now uh, I know I only I literally only have maybe one uh, or two um, you know hard goes left so now it's about when do I use it um, and where do I use it? So we're coming up uh, again to uh, the S-curve downhill. And the thing that's going through my mind here um, is, you know, again, get myself back into position to make sure that I can be in that like top 10, top 15 uh, series of wheels um, to, so that I can make sure that I take my own choice lines. Uh, you know, because you, you, you never know. You never know uh, when you get into tight corners and you're doing 30 miles an hour and you're also having to navigate, um, you know, curving uh, landscape. 
you never know you know what the wheel uh, handling capabilities of the people around you are so um you know you, you always just want to try and be as safe as possible so again i'm i'm in the the position that i want to be um i'm using minimal amounts of energy to get there um and just trying to protect myself as much as possible I'm spiking up here uh, over 600 watts again, um, you know, and that's more because it, you know this is an area where uh, people like to attack. Harlem Hill is, uh, you know, you're coming in with speed, and it, as I showed before, if you attack it at the right time, you can escape, you know, you achieve escape velocity. So I see this group up here, you know, and I'm saying, okay, uh, if this is successful, uh, this could be. You know this could be a great attempt so i'm putting in some effort here but you notice i'm not spiking the way that i did before like you know over 800 watts and you know 700 watts sustained or anything along those lines i'm basically just holding you know it may not look like it but this is a metered measured effort again just to make contact and to maintain contact as much as possible so my goal here wasn't necessarily to try and drop the field my goal here was just to make contact make the the measure of you know the riders that are up here and if they truly are uh, looking like they are in a dangerous you know a dangerous uh, possibility of, of breaking away then going to the well again and spiking it up but in this particular case um, i was able to make a snap judgment that uh, they likely were not going to go anywhere and that's you know based on body language um, based on the speed with which i was able to close down and so on and so forth uh, to basically say, okay, I don't, I don't need to go deep in the well. I can keep this at a, you know, relatively measured effort. And so by, you know, laying off the power a little bit, I also allow other people to uh, come around and uh, fill in those gaps. And so what ends up happening is that rather than me having to, uh, you know, keep my foot on the gas, as it were. Um, I'm basically teasing out people to close, uh, you know, to close this down for me. So for a minimal amount of energy expenditure, I've been able to tease out the field uh, and by staying connected to them, I've been able to tease out the field and just, you know, ride their, uh, uh, you know, ride their efforts right into a headwind. And you notice, keep myself sheltered um, and going south, uh, you know, keep myself sheltered from the wind and also because it's not just the wind but it's also the, the very rolling uh, terrain of the backside of the course. So while we're coming through, I also wanted to, uh, you know, recognize, uh, you know, some of the teams that are represented uh, in this field. Uh, you have teams like Foundation, uh, Dave Jordan, um, which also, you know, they are, uh, they have a namesake race, uh, the Dave Jordan uh, Classic in Central Park. Um, you have the Major Taylor Development Team. Um, you have the Lonely Heart Cycling Team. Um, there's a NYCC team, uh, good guys, 
um, and you know, Veselka, countless, countless teams uh, that are represented um, in this field. And uh, you know, yes, you know, you notice that there are some um, with respect to uh, uh, you know handling and, and stuff like that. There's sometimes here's another attack that's going. Uh, uh, I actually, when I saw this attack going, um, again, when we're talking about location. Um, this was at the at the end of the last sister, and so all of this is just downhill. Um, so you can see right here, I basically just put out enough energy to just maintain contact. Again, maintain contact, not close anything down myself. But you'll see, you know, I'm doing 32 miles an hour, going downhill, and I was doing like 200 to 300 watts. You know, now I'm now I'm up at like three 350 to 400 because we're doing 36 miles an hour. But I'm also able to kind of just spike it right back down to zero to 100 watts. So again, very minimal effort just to maintain contact, just in case. Um, but that's also one of the reasons why this makes it a really bad place to try and do a breakaway. Um, and that's one of the reasons why when I saw them go by, I was not worried at all um, because of the location uh, of where they were trying to do it. Now, if they were trying to break away earlier, you know, if they had done it maybe on the second sister or the first sister, you know, that may have been a different story. But as far as location is concerned, but again, given the speed with which, you know, they went by the field, um, it wasn't a punchy enough effort to make the field, you know, basically have a, a second thought, a second thought about, well, do I really want to follow this? And sometimes that, that two, three, five second um, uh, hesitation can be all that you need. And then you see here, there's another attack initiated by... Uh, the guy in pink, um, I, I, can't, I uh, ended up speaking, whoa, there. <laughs> uh, I ended up speaking with uh, with him and his teammate here and uh, after the race, and uh, this is Lonely Hearts. And um, uh, this this guy sitting right here, his name is Phil. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as he got on the front, I, I actually pulled up alongside him and I recognized exactly what he was doing. Uh, thanks for the wave, uh, good guys in the rear camera. Uh, uh, and you see he's looking around and he's looking to, you know, looking at the break. Uh, but I pulled up alongside Phil and I said, you know, uh, uh, that was a good attempt, but those guys, they don't have good escape velocity. Uh, you know, they're going to get caught very easily, but, and you guys don't have enough field, uh, enough people in the field to really block this down. So I'm just riding the front and you see, I'm not really in a bad way. I'm only, you know, my heart rate's only at 161. Um, you know, my max heart rate is like 185. Um, so I'm just sitting pretty comfortably and just holding this speed, uh, not doing particularly hard effort. And we are maintaining, um, the same amount of distance. And that's how I knew this, you know, this particular break attempt was not going to get very far. Um, a, because they're not, setting up into a pace line they're kind of spread across the field looking at each other and b um even the fact that you know i'm doing 29 miles an hour you still have people that are filling in the gaps so again that's one of those situations where um just you know i'm, I'm gaining more and more experience as i as i race more and more um i was just like yep this is not going to go anywhere um but you know and i was talking with phil about that i was saying you know that was um, I understood exactly what you were trying to do in terms of getting on the front, but, um, you know, your guy in pink, um, his name is Dan. Uh, I was like, yeah, he didn't, he didn't go off hard enough, um, in order to achieve that, that snap gap where it's just like, oh, do I really want to spend some energy closing this down? Uh, that, and that's again, what I talked about earlier when talking about escape velocity. So, um, this is just all of the stuff that I'm I'm keeping an eye on uh, and you know taking notes of during the race in real time um, and trying to be kind of I guess a, a, a student as much as possible uh, and and then apply that in real world situations. So we just you know they got caught. Uh, we're all back together again. Again, I'm just resting here. Um, sitting in the field, trying to use as little energy as possible. You know, we're still going at a pretty good clip. Um, and now it's, again, as I mentioned before, energy preservation as much as possible. 
uh, you know, keep an eye on what's going on in the field. Um, look up the road every once in a while and just make sure that no one is no one is uh, you know particularly far away or anything along those lines, or no one's trying to get away. And, but otherwise, uh, you know, be along for the ride and then look for the next opportunity. So one thing I'm going to point out here, you know, as we're coming back around Cat's Paw again, um, you notice that we're actually not moving that fast. Uh, and one of the things that I had noticed during the race, and again, in real time, um, was that basically, yes, we were getting up and over Cat's Paw, but um, the effort required and the speed that we were taking over Cat's Paw was not particularly high. So I started... You know, again, for this particular race, because sometimes in a race, you know, everyone's just attacking, you know, attacking the hell out of Cat's Paw. And there's no way in hell that you're going to, uh, you know, try and uh, uh, do anything there. But for this particular race, it was like, huh, the field is slowing down every single time uh, we hit Cat's Paw and everyone kind of just, um, everyone kind of just takes it easy. Uh, as we go up and you know I say that as I was doing like 380 watts but you know again relatively uh, compared to other efforts um, so this was just another thing that I just cataloged in the back of my head and again you know formulating ideas and strategies in real time um, as we're racing but you notice again keeping myself sheltered as much as possible even though we're in a tailwind section just trying to again stay in the tuck um, and uh uh, making sure that, you know, I'm just watching who's around me and what they're doing. Um, and just, again, trying to meter uh, energy expenditure and, uh, you know, keep an eye on what the field is doing, how fast it's going at any particular moment in time, and um, see if there's any potential opportunities to take advantage. So you notice here, um, basically throughout this entire section, you notice that my heart rate has just been dropping, dropping, dropping. Um, my power is, you know, very low if non-existent. Um, and again, this is just kind of the power of uh, <laughs> the power of riding in a pack. Um, and again, trying to bring the heart rate down as much as possible. Again, knowing coming into the race that I had a very limited budget uh, for um, attacks, for, you know, uh, threshold work, for spikes, uh, you know, uh, I just knew that, cons you know, conservation was basically the name of the game. Now again here, 
I've had an opportunity to to rest. My heart rate is in the you know mid to upper 130s, low 140s. So I'm able to use some of that banked energy um, to put in some effort and keep contact with the with the people that are moving up to the front uh, again, so that I can be in that top 10, top 15. Uh, you know, range of cyclists going into the downhill, make sure that I can take my, my choice uh, lines and, uh, you know, as fewer people that are in front of me as possible, safer I'll be. Again, spiked up the power a little bit, uh, you notice, but this time it was lower than the last couple of times that I came through. Um, again, because I knew that I had a couple of people that are right by me, that they would fill in that gap. Um, and as you saw, they did. And so I was on I only had to, you know, spend energy in the 300s uh, coming in to just to make contact here. Um, so again, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the, uh, you know, the, the riders around me. There's no one that's looking like they're looking to go anywhere. So I'm just looking at it and saying, okay, you know, I'll take this, uh, I'll take this in the 200s or 300s um, in terms of effort. You know, I'm not looking at my my head unit, but I, you know, I can tell like what my general effort is. Um, I saw you know a couple of people uh, come out front, but then they sat up. <laughs> you know? So you know, one of the things my coaches uh, is always uh, talk to me about is. Uh, you know, make a move with a purpose. So, you know, if you if you move to the front of a field, don't just move to the front to sit on the front, because uh, then you're just giving everyone else a free ride. If you're going to make a move, do it with a purpose, do it with a reason, um, because any move that you do, you're basically you're basically taking from your bank. Um, so, even an innocuous move like that, um, it's it's going to cost you, and it may cost you down the line. So. Um, you know, I used to make the, that, you know, that same type of mistake, uh, you know, when I was racing earlier. And it's just one of those things that, again, you know, <laughs> I, I talk like I'm, a, I'm some grizzled veteran or whatever. But, you know, these are just things that you just learn as you do more and more and more races. So, um, but that was some that was a mistake that I used to make all the time. So I kind of I kind of laughed and smiled to myself because, uh, uh, I you know, I try to be a steward a, you know, a student of my own journey and, and recognize um, the same mistakes that I that I would make. Um, so that being said, here, you just saw this attack, you know, this, uh, this attempted attack come through. And I actually uh, expected that uh, because we took Harlem Hill um, at such a pedestrian pace. Um, it seemed like, you know, people would get antsy. But because everyone is antsy and everyone is kind of rested relative to this space in the course, again, those people that were uh, jumping off the front, um, you know, they didn't like basically everyone's rested here. So you're going to have multiple people closing this gap. And that's part of the reason why I just sat in because I'm also looking at the speed with which they're moving. And it's like, yeah, they're not going anywhere. I'm not concerned about that because the field is not strung out again you know i've been able to get into a number of successful breaks um the most successful one uh again that i had mentioned earlier was the green mountain stage race day three um we actually broke away me um my coach uh rick sorensen of bello john and uh another uh, cyclist his name is josh uh, we broke away from the break um over the Lincoln Gap climb. And um, the only reason we didn't actually get away completely, uh, you know, because I was looking at, we basically were like two to three minutes up on the break that we had broken from. And then that break was about five minutes up on the field. And we knew this because we had a, uh, a pace uh, motorcycle, um, you know, letting us know like, basically what what was going on uh on the course uh and we knew that especially when we got out of radio range that we were in a good spot uh i got a flat tire <laughs> like 47 miles in 
you talk about heartbreak um that one because i was basically looking at at the time um my first podium and or outright win uh last september and i was just i was crushed like beyond words um like ugly crying uh over over that type of you know loss because of a mechanical uh thankfully the next day i was able to get second place in the criterium um but you know that seemed to be like more the universe just saying yeah here's a gimme <laughs> we we screwed you on you know on the road race so here's a gimme you know you suck at crits but you know here here's a make good for us uh sending that lightning bolt to make your tire go flat um, but anyway, the reason why I mentioned that, uh, again, is, you know, when you talk about riding successful brakes, um, you have to punch away. You have to punch away with so much force that people are looking around um, and wondering, hey, is someone else going to take that? Um, you can't just kind of roll away and then hope for the best. So this break is up the road. Um, they've got maybe like a five second gap on us right now. Uh, but again, you know, we're in the fastest part of the course, except for the downhill uh, going into Harlem Hill. And so, you know, I'm doing 150 to 200 watts and 33 miles an hour, um, you know, sitting in the draft. Yes, but also I'm still only about six wheels back. So you would think, you know, I would have to be mashing it in order to maintain this type of speed. But no because this is also just a downward uh, sloping part of the course. But here you can see actually uh, Lonely Heart Cycling Club. Uh, I actually did something a little sneaky here. Um, <laughs> I mentioned, uh, hey, they have LACC has uh, teammates up the road. And that's what caused that first person to go off. But the thing that actually really shocked me is that uh, they actually started chasing their own teammates. And you know, you see the guy that uh, took off on the front, he just pulled off on the right-hand side. His teammate is up the road in that break, but he just made a hard surge. And so I was just like, dude, what are you doing? That's your teammate. Don't chase your teammate, especially if they're in a break situation. But, I, you know, look, when I saw that, I was just like, well, more power to you. That's a free ride for me. Um, and I was <laughs> just pretty grateful for it. And he put in such a hard effort. Now, you know, that, that break that had maybe five seconds up the road, now there may be two seconds. And so he closed down his own teammate. Um, and I saw here again, this NYCC uh, rider, he was, uh, you know, starting to tire, you know, with like three bike lengths to go. And I'm like, nope, I'm not going to close that down. I'm, I'm continuing to meter my efforts here. And you can see right here by clockwork, uh, a few other people filled in the gap and now we're just rolling through i stayed on again on the inside knowing where the wind was coming from so that i could stay protected and keep my energy expenditures low uh, relative to everyone else and also you know to the speed that we're doing and boom right back together so you know another lesson about you know riding brakes or whatnot um you know don't chase your teammates <laughs> <laughs> if you see your teammate is up the road, do not chase your teammates. Uh, uh, the only time you should even think about chasing your teammate is if there's another person that has you know, made escape velocity um, and you're somehow able to time it so that you basically get a free ride to your teammate. But that was not the case in that situation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, like, like I said, this is just, again, tons of mistakes that that i've made in these races and so that's you know it's because of the mistakes that i've made and the analysis that i've done after the fact um that i'm able to talk about uh, these sorts of things um and so you know as i mentioned these things you know there's no uh there's no like you know sense of grandeur or anything along those lines because you know i'm, I'm a cat four <laughs> you know i'm not a pro or anything along those lines i'm uh, i'm like everyone else trying to learn um and trying to get the last of my points to upgrade uh to a cat three and hopefully continue beyond um but i point these things out to you so that you also you know maybe there are some of you out there uh, who can learn from this in the same way that i have 
uh, and use this to get you know better at your own racing craft. So see here, this is uh, coming out of Horseshoe Alley um, and going into Cat's Paw. You know, it's a very fast area. You notice <clears throat> my power basically before hitting Cat's Paw was in like the double digits to low triple digits and doing 30 miles an hour. So this was the third time coming through, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, not the third time. This was uh, um, the fourth time coming into cat's paw and like clockwork the fuel slowed down we're doing 17 miles an hour 18 miles an hour you know i'm holding you know threshold 360 370 but um you know my heart rate's in the mid 160s um we're not going that fast and so this was actually the time where i was just like hmm um this is happening again and again and again uh the field is really not you know coming through cat's paw with any level of force or any amount of, uh, of energy or anything along those lines um you know maybe there's an opportunity there again saying to myself you know i only have a little bit of, of budget left uh as far as energy is concerned i know i'm not going to out sprint anyone uh at at the line you know that's not that's not the type of rider that i am um and <laughs> and i have tried I've definitely tried uh, to to train myself to be uh, a sprinter and, and uh, you know learn those uh, you know those those tactics. But in New York City, I mean, there's such a density of quality, you know, high power riders that uh, you know, <laughs> like there are people that they are literally in the blink of an eye uh, where you are, and then you know, <laughs> you know. 30 feet, 50 feet up the road uh, immediately. Um, and you, you, you wouldn't even be able to tell what just happened because they're just, they have so much punch uh, in, their, in their sprint. And that's not something that I have. Uh, that's not my power profile. So, you know, it's about learning how to, you know, recognize my strengths, understand my weaknesses, and then basically say, how can I optimize for my own strengths and uh, try and minimize my weaknesses so i'm thinking at this point um because i have such little energy left um i'm you know and i'm already at a disadvantage if it comes down to a field sprint so i'm already starting to think what is it can i do um to put myself in a potentially winning position and so that thought is what's going through my mind right now as i'm holding you know 45 watts and uh, spiking up to you know 300, but then back to 190, and so on and so forth, um, and just basically bringing my heart rate down and recovering at 29 miles an hour. Uh, those are the questions. That's the question that I'm really thinking: is how can I uh, maximize what I think are you know my potential perceived strengths? Oh, and uh, my friend on the right lost his uh, lost his uh, clip in, and uh, good save. Um, you see him reappear on the rear camera on the upper left in the blue. Um, so, yeah, that's basically what I'm thinking at this point. Um, use what little energy economy I've got left um, and try and come up with something that I think could potentially be a winning strategy. So, and that comes into play um, uh, not too, not too uh, long from now, actually. Uh, actually, uh, toward the end of this lap. So another thing I noticed here as well, there wasn't the same mad dash uh, to get to 
the downhill like there had been in the prior laps. And so I'm taking mental note of this and saying, okay, it seems like the field is collectively starting to just get tired and or is tired and it's just, you know, settling in and oh, there you go. Uh, uh, Got to watch your lines, uh, the, the blue man on my left. Um, who just went in front of me right here? You know, he almost wiped out uh, his fellow uh, his fellow cyclist by not being able to hold his line. Um, so you know, the field is going is is going relatively slow compared to um, what it had been doing. You notice that I was basically doing like 100 to 150 watts, 200 watts, um, no spiking, just very smooth here. So again, this is a mental note: the field seems tired. Uh, doesn't seem like it wants to do as hard of an effort and so on and so forth. But because we also came down and there wasn't a race for the downhill, I'm also thinking to myself, let me move up because there may be an attempt to get away here, you know, detecting a lull in the field. So because I kind of was able to anticipate that, I was able to move up with, you know, a relatively low expenditure of energy. Again, as I say that, you know, as I'm spiking over 600 to 700 watts, but Again, for this, you know, for this level, uh, uh, this time in the race, I just wanted to maintain contact. Again, I wasn't looking to try and, you know, break hard from the field because I didn't know who these people were. Um, but I'm, you know, paying attention to their escape velocity. I'm paying attention to their body language, and, you know, they're, you know, they're mashing pretty hard and, uh, um, you know, putting in a lot of effort. Um, but when you notice like the head is down and you kind of look down at the legs and so on and so forth, um, it's like, okay, that effort was, it was hard. Um, and as you notice, if you look in the, in the rear cam on the upper left, we did actually achieve some escape, but it was so tiring, um, you know, for the people here that there wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be enough to actually sustain a break. Also, um, we were only a couple of seconds ahead of the field. And so even though that was a good attempt, it did not meet the criteria in my own head of, you know, talking about escape velocity. So um, this guy on the front as well, you know, he's putting in a valiant effort, but I'm also looking at it from the perspective of um, if you're trying to make a break work, you know, he's elbowing me through and I've just let him know here, hey, the field is on us. And he just looked back and he saw but I knew that about 10 seconds ago. And so I was just sitting on his wheel. I wasn't going to come through because I was like, I have to watch my own effort. So right here, I kind of anticipated that there was going to be a counterattack and boom, right there. Um, I didn't know that it was coming, but I kind of felt it. The only difference here, though, is that they tried, you know, they tried to counterattack. But as you see right there, they're only like maybe three bike lengths up the road. So I'm looking at this and it was like the, the, the idea was sound. But I just don't think at this point in the race they had enough legs to make it work. So I, you know, I put in a little effort as a just in case. Uh, I saw you know two cyclists move in front of me, so I was able to kind of uh, uh, suck some of the draft a little bit. But then you notice you get up here, and then people are just kind of sitting around and looking at each other. So again, this was one where I'm looking back and I'm like, yeah, this isn't going anywhere. Uh, there's just no organization and. Uh, you know, and I think it's just a case of you, because we're in the fours, um, people don't have that much experience in local races with riding brakes because except for Central Park, um, all of the other courses are generally very flat. So I just got elbowed through and you see like I didn't spike my power. Um, you know, I'm still doing 350 to 450 uh, and then I lowered it down into the you know low 300s and upper 200s. Um, again, because I knew that the field was here. So there's no point in trying to burn a match, uh, trying to get away. And I saw, you know, I saw these two people going up the road. Um, but I was like, yeah, they're not going to get that far anyway, because the whole field is here. Um, and I think that they realized it. And you can see they started looking back and then they sat up. So, you know, this is just one of those things where, again, um, when I had been racing uh, before, I really dedicated it to learning you know about this craft and really trying to put in a lot of you know you know hours like watching other races and things along those lines i would have made the mistake of trying to bridge up to them and hope and hope that something happened but 
um, I'm, you know, I'm basically getting better at being able to suss out uh, when there's real opportunity versus um, when there's not. And, you know, for the vast majority of these, most of these are not. And so I'm just getting better at understanding the dynamics of brake racing and uh, when something is really, like, truly dangerous. So we just saw um, uh, Lonely Hearts uh, come on by, and you know I thought you know at first I thought you know is he attacking or is he just trying to get to the front? Um, I wasn't sure uh, exactly what was happening. So all you know all I'm doing here is just poking my head out and just seeing what's going on, um, and you know I couldn't really tell exactly what was happening here. Uh, but then I noticed, you know, it's like, okay, well, he's sitting on the front. So, again, you know, this is just one of those things where, you know, I, I'm saying to myself, um, you know, what were you trying to do with that move? Um, you know, were you were, were you trying to make contact with the teammate? Um, were you trying to get away? Uh, you know, so on and so forth. And it's like, what was the purpose? What was the intent behind the move? And, um, you know, I wasn't sure. But because it didn't go anywhere, that just ended up being a match that got burned. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things again. And I, you know, that that's a mistake I used to make all the time. It's something that I actually have to talk to myself now, where I'm literally having to tell myself, patience, don't go, don't go, just stay patient, stay calm, don't do it. Um, it's not something that is second nature to me yet. Um, I still have to like uh, let my coach's uh, uh, my coach's words, you know, ring through my head. Like, stay, stay hidden. You know, and you can see right here. I'm, I'm, I know that the wind is coming from the right and the front, so I'm on the left side of the on the left side of the course, staying protected and letting them uh, shield me. So you know, doing 25 miles an hour at 150 watts, uh, that's about as good as it gets. Um, so again, you know, I, seeing the behavior of the field, uh, you start to notice that people, they get antsy um, just generally uh, when, when they're tired. Um, the field is not responding um, as forcefully as it had been uh, in the earlier stages of the race. The field is tending to, to ride more smoothly. And as you, you know, you can tell by, you know, my power output, like we're moving and I'm barely having to put out any amount of power whatsoever. Um, and, you know, coming through here, one of the things that I had uh, just been keeping in mind this whole time is, um, you know, well, I'm anticipating that because of, because cat's paw is coming up, um, we're going to slow down again. And so again, I'm thinking about all of this, thinking about the fields, you know, uh, body language, as it were, looking at the body language of the cyclists around me. Um, generally, when I see people starting to get out of the saddle, when we're, you know, we're not going that fast, you know, doing t uh, 20 miles an hour, um, that is a sign of fatigue as well, um, you know, drifting in the field and so on and so forth. So I'm thinking more and more, this may be an opportunity, this may be a chance um, to get away. So I flipped and made the uh, the reverse, the, the rear camera, the main camera, and I put the front camera uh, up on the upper left. And as you've seen from before, the reason for that is because I'm gearing up uh, for an attack. 
Um, and I've already kind of made the decision in my mind. Um, it's not a, it's not completely formed yet. I'm still trying to decide one way or the other. You know, I'm looking at my heart rate. I'm really trying to gauge how much energy do I have left. I'm also up near the front, uh, you know, near the front, not on the front, but near the front, just so I can see is the field starting to slow? Am I starting to hear, you know, the, the telltale sign of people stopping pedaling and so on and so forth? And I'm starting, you know, people touching brakes and so on and so forth. So, again, making all of these decisions uh, in real time. And as we're coming through and I'm seeing, you know, our pace is starting to slow and, you know, the amount of power that I'm having to hold just to even make a tiny little uh, improvement on the field, I'm like, now's the time to go. And so I punch it and I see I punch it up to over 900 watts. And my goal here was... If, we're, if the field is coming through here with the same expectation of just taking it easy, this is an opportunity to take them off guard. And so you can see right there of Cat's Paw, um, I've already gotten a really nice gap um, by punching it up over 700 watts to 900 watts for a few seconds. And then my goal here was, okay, I've just raised my heart rate up. Again, you know, my max is like 185, I'm at 173. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, just hold threshold, you know, use this downhill uh, out of cat's paw to recover a little bit while still maintaining some Z2 power in the, the mid 200s. Um, yeah, so, you know, mid 200s, low 300s, like Z2. Um, and then once coming out of that, punch it back up to threshold and, and in the mid 400s and to the 500s. Um, to maintain speed and then grow the lead. So you can see right here, the lead is getting larger. Um, coming out of cast par, I had about a five second lead. Um, by this point, uh, where I'm, you know, going into the, uh, I'm about to make the turn into the straightaway. Now the lead is closer to eight seconds. Um, and so this was my goal was, um, you know, to try and punch it away, to break away from the field, um, and to get to basically get to the downhill uh, with about a three to five second gap. That was my hope. And I wanted to punch it up knowing that the field would likely start moving on uh, on the straightaway through Engineer's Gate, um, you know, and basically saying, if I can get this gap up to like 10 to 15 seconds past Engineer's Gate, I'm hoping that that will be enough. You can see I'm basically holding threshold here. My goal was basically keep it at 24 to 26. Um, and I'm spiking it just to make sure. And I was like, you know, 24 is not fast enough. I, I'm looking back and I'm like, I need to get that up to 25. Um, and so at this point, I'm like, I just need to get to the downhill. If I can get to the downhill with about five seconds of gap, um, and I'm looking back and I'm like, I've got about a 10 second, maybe a 12 second gap here between me and the, the rest of the field. Um, this, this person actually here in my rear cam, this is actually a person from the women's field um, who I actually mistook at first uh, for someone to my field until I realized, oh wait, no, <laughs> no, you're from the women's field. So, um, but just, you know, you're looking over your shoulder you can't really tell, you just see a bike silhouette and you're like, ah, crap. Um, I kind of hoped that it was someone who had bridged across, uh, but as soon as I realized that it wasn't, uh, I just made sure that you know I didn't. I was trying my best not to sit in her draft. Um, so coming through here, you know, I, I'm taking a look over my shoulder again. I'm like, let me try and use this downhill. I can pick up some speed a little bit and then recover a little bit and then punch it up over the top of this uh, little climb before hitting. Uh, you see I'm, you know, up over 550 watts. Um, but the thing here is that because, again, I had such a limited amount of energy in the day, um, what, you know, would have normally been an effort that I would have been able to hold all the way through, um, I was just, at this point, after, you know, racing the other two days and after having put in some hard efforts earlier in the race, you know, I basically ran out of gas. And so my hope of hitting... Uh, the downhill with like a five second gap so that I could recover on the downhill and then hit it again on Harlem Hill, um, it fizzled out. So um, they basically caught on. Um, you can see they're making, they're, they're closing in right now. I think it's about a one second gap, maybe two seconds at this moment. And I realized that. And I realized that that was basically my race. 
uh, right there. That that unsuccessful move was uh, uh, was my race. I didn't have anything left. Um, but coming in uh, down here, um, and just so you know, my uh, my rear camera is actually about about to run out of power. Um, and then I'll have about maybe about uh, uh, five minutes, four or five minutes or so of, of life in my front camera. I was anticipating that there would be a counterattack here, um, but the counterattack actually never came. And uh, I was actually told by uh, some of the other riders in the field that um, uh, this effort and then the other effort that I had put out earlier um, had basically strung the field out um, and so, you know, now my rear cameras died. And so people were not necessarily looking to immediately counterattack. But again, that's a situation where I'm like, if it's strung out, that's a perfect time to counterattack because then the field mentally and physically is not in a place where um, uh, it's going to be as willing to respond. So even though I'm, you know, I'm basically out of gas, um, I still had enough to, you know, do some threshold and, and super threshold efforts to just maintain contact um, and, and ride, uh, you know, ride on these people's wheels. Um, but the, the escape velocity uh, efforts, those were completely gone. Um, usually, you know, I might have like a handful or so of those, of those efforts, uh, in any given race. Um, I had exactly two <laughs> in, in, in this race. I was working very, very low budget, um, uh, in this particular race, but you can see right here, those two people that are just crested and they just look back. Um, as soon as I saw that happen, I said, that's the winning, that's the winning race. That's the winning move. Um, and the reason is because they did exactly what I was hoping to do, which was crest Harlem Hill um, with several seconds of a lead um, after having recovered on the downhill five seconds up the road. Um, and as you can see right there, they are basically gone. Um, the field at this point is going to be way too tired to close that down. And, uh, um, and I recognized it immediately. I was just like, if I had had um, another bullet, uh, either the field would not have caught me or I would have been able to um, attach myself to those two cyclists as they were cresting and then get away with them. And they actually ended up uh, rolling away and winning. It was, I think it was a three-man break, um, uh, that one. And, you know, when you see that, it validated the idea, but, you know, I basically... <laughs> <laughs> it basically had a body that couldn't cast the mental check. Um, so I, I spiked it up one last time uh, here just to check one more time to see how much of a gap they had, you know, about 500 watts. Uh, and I was just like, yeah, that's about as much energy as I've got. Uh, I couldn't, I could not get it over 500. I was like, nah, yeah, uh, three, 350 to 450. That's about where I'm rolling. Um, so I backed it down. And as before, uh, I let other people fill in the gaps here. So um, this is pretty much how the rest of it, uh, you know, plays out. Um, I ended up coming in, uh, maintaining contact, you know, sitting in the top 10. But again, uh, I had no finishing uh, energy left, no finishing speed. And so when we hit cat's paw, I couldn't get it over like 300 watts. Uh, that was <laughs> so I think I, I probably rolled in for like, you know, 30th or something like that. Uh, but I understood that going in. I understood that that was going to be my, my race, uh, you know, come hell or high water. So um, anyway, we're coming to the end of the video. Um, I wanted to thank you if you're still here listening uh, to my ramblings. Um, I just I really love uh, this type of uh, this type of course. And um, I hope uh, you found my thoughts on this insightful. Um, I really hope that we have more races in Central Park. And if you enjoyed this, uh, you know, please feel free to like, uh, comment, subscribe. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got like another 45 races to go. So more videos coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.